This video was tough to make and it's going to be long, it's going to be boring and technical, but it's going to make you really understand what's going on. So I think it's worth actually sticking to the end of it. So let's get started. This is a story about mostly a codec, H.264. What's a codec? It's responsible for recording, compression and distributions of videos. It's not the only one, as an example, it's not actually used by YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, but it is used by Twitch as an example and it is relied upon when using VLC or FFmpeg. Now this codec is patented. There's a patent pool called MPEG LA that has the patents. What's a patent, patent pool? It's when many companies actually get together to defend the interest of a patent and they form a cohesive group which is a patent pool. This means that if you do want to use this codec, codec or ship it, you should pay a license fee. Now this fee cannot actually be an unlimited fee. That is, a company like Red Hat cannot buy an unlimited fee to make all of its users use this codec, but they actually have to pay for, pay for each customer that goes on and actually uh, gets a software that includes these codecs. Now, who is responsible legally for this kind of things? It's usually the last person to assemble the software stack that actually allows you to use this codec. So if you have a distribution that actually takes all of these components and put them together in order for you to be able to use them, they are very much liable. On the other hand, if the distribution distribution doesn't actually ship this kind of things and you are the one actually installing the packages, then you should in theory pay the fee and, fee and you are liable for what you're doing. Are these patents going to expire? Yes. Anytime soon? Well, it's not so clear. Now, M MPEG LA is actually quite transparent about what they're doing, but actually understanding when it's going to expire, it's not so easy because there's not single pat there's not just one patent, it's many. But the common idea is that no, they're not going to expire anytime soon, like in the coming years, but five, 10 years, who knows? Okay, so this was the intro. So what has happened actually? Well, the hardware manufacturers that ship something GPU accelerated actually only have a partial implementation of this codex. Whereas that if the implementation is only partial, partial that means that uh, they're not, they are not the last part in the, they are not the last to actually assemble all of the software stack to use this codex. And so they don't have to pay anything. So what you get from GPU manufacturers, as an example, with uh, some ex exceptions, I think, is not the actual implementation of the codex, but uh, it's only a partial one. Fedora, even before all of this happened, did not ship the uh, missing piece to all of this, so, or <laughs> at least they thought. The missing piece, that is, like the remaining software that would make that partial implementation completely working for the user. Now, one day in April, somebody at Red Hat has discovered that Mesa through VA API was actually shipping enough for distro to make sure that they add a complete software stack to use these codecs together with this partial implementation by hardware manufacturers. And that's an issue because technically that means that they are putting together all of this software stack and they are liable to be sued. So what did they do? Well, they just turned this part off back in April. This was off for all of this time. And then one day it was reverted by one person that is not the maintainer and also not the Red Hat person in Mesa. So that was slightly weird. And when it was discovered, it was immediately turned it back off. All of this happened between federal releases. So the last uh, federal release, 37, is actually the first release with this meta modified version of Mesa with this component turned off so that it does not have enough software to make this, to make the codex working together with the partial implementation of the hardware manufa manufacturers. One week after it was turned off and then one week after it was turned back on and then back off, everybody notices. 
So let's talk what this actually means for the user, what you can do to avoid this, to make sure that you still preserve the ability to use FFmpeg as an example. As an example, in my case, I use OBS Studio to record videos. I do need that. Well, there are two options. Actually, Red Hat has a contract with Cisco and Cisco does provide a software acceleration only version of H.264 codecs. How do they do that? Well, they pay the license, simply enough. <laughs> but it's only H.264 and it's only software acceleration, no hardware acceleration. They va VA API component that was turned off is actually now shipped or will be soon shipped by RPM Fusion. So you can add that, uh, R you can add RPM Fusion and install that. But uh, how they're able to do that? Well, RPM Fusion is actually based in France and France for this kind of things is either kind of a legal gray area, making it difficult to sue them, or maybe in France, these kind of patents don't actually apply at all. However, they do apply in the rest of Europe and in the USA. So even if you think that these kind of patents shouldn't exist for software, okay, we can have that discussion, but that is not what we're addressing right now. Right now, these patents do exist both US and Amer um, Europe. Now, if you do install this package, technically you assemble the software stack so you could also be sued for this but realistically enough uh, <laughs> MP, MPEG LA is not interested in suing you personally it wouldn't get really any money out of it so it's very unlikely of course things are different if you are a big company this does mean that going from one federal release to the next one you might lose something like Chrome or Firefox hardware acceleration if you do not install this VA API component for, from RPM Fusion. Now, let's focus a bit more on the legal side of things and try to understand whether it was actually reasonable for Fedora to pull this off if this was actually a risk. Like, could, could they actually be sued? And if so, I mean, Ubuntu is doing the same. Why aren't them getting sued? Firstly, try to understand that there is a hurry. Like they did all of this in a hurry for a very specific reason. As soon as they discovered that they were infringing these patents, they had to act on it immediately. Because if you are discovered infringing a patent and you knew about it, that's willful infringement. And that is two to three times more in, if you actually go to court. So if you get sued between discovering that this is happening and when you actually turn this off, ev everything that you, sh you would have paid, you pay two, three times more. So they add to act on it in a hurry. So how much were they going to pay? Let's try to get an idea if they indeed got sued. Well, the math is based on the lost revenue for these groups, which is not very easy to calculate, especially in the open source world, because in the open source world, uh, code is available available for everyone. You don't have like a few customers that get to you and buy your product. Anyone can go on Fedora's website and install Fedora. And remember that there's no way for Red Hat to actually buy some unlimited license for all of its customers or users from Red Hat, I mean. The cost of just doing <laughs> the lawsuit, like addressing it, on average, Googling is roughly between two and four million dollars, which is a lot. And the average for how much money you end up paying is around nine million, but it really depends on the situation. In this case, it could be significantly more because of what I said, and sometimes it's a lot more. As an example, Intel, once lost a lawsuit regarding these kind of things and had to pay two billion dollars, which is a, lo a lot. I don't have that money. <laughs> One could try to like estimate a bit this. You can consider like you can count the amount of Red Hat and Fedora instances. Then it's something like five dollars each for that patent. And then 
if it's willful infringement, as I said, you have to multiply that by three, and then you actually have to add all of the customers that you had in the past, but you don't have anymore. That is all the people that actually used Red Hat, Fedora, and now don't use it anymore, like me. <laughs> you can easily see how that easily gets to a very high number. This is actually why I've seen reports from the inter entertainment industry where companies actually ban FMPEG and VLC that relies on it altogether. They do not want to get sued in no way regarding this kind of things. So they avoid the usage of this codex entirely. It's easy to think that if Fedora did ship this codex out of the box, then Fedora would also be banned in this kind of companies as well. You might say, okay, but I don't know of any recent lawsuit regarding this, but keep in mind that usually in this kind of things, they end up either in like an agreement between the two parties, but even if, the, even if not, you do end up with an NDA at the end of it, a non-disclosure agreement. So you don't quite hear about these kind of things after they happened, unless it's very big players. Now, Red Hat has actually gone through this in a very similar scenario with MP3 in the 90s. So they very much not want to go through that again, especially because if you do get code messing up with patents for the second time, it's much more likely for it to be willful and you might have to pay even more. You might ask, okay, but can't they have just a server here in, I don't know, some legal gray area, but not, not quite because What's important is where you're, where you're based on, and they cannot move Red Hat to a different country, really. Okay, so to finish this off, the most important question, Ubuntu is doing this. Why is, isn't Ubuntu getting sued? And okay, there are various arguments that could be done about this. Firstly, it's important to notice that I won't go into details about this, but Ubuntu does not seem to care in general about these kind of things. In the past, they had similar issues that were raised and they did not address them. So their legal team does not seem to care. Then you should also consider that if you're suing somebody for this, you do want to get a lot of money out of it, again, just suing is cost both sides between two and four million dollars and Ubuntu does not currently seem to be be very profitable. So one reason that Ubuntu is not getting sued could be that it doesn't seem like an appealing target. You would ideally want a company that's very big and very profitable to sue that you can you're sure you can get a lot of money out from. Like I don't know, IBM. Now, this might come as a surprise, but EBM nowadays, nowadays, it seems that it's not. It's actually very profitable. It has lots of, lots of money. It has lots of money, more, more than me. And you might know that EBM owns Red Hat. So they are responsible for this, meaning that if you want to sue regarding, regarding this codex, it's like the choice is between suing Ubuntu, a very small company with not very profitable, profitable or seeing EBM, super big, international, lots of money, not quite the same thing. Also, Ubuntu kind of gets this kind of things from Debian, which is based on, and Debian and Arch, actually they are together in the same, in, say, in, in the same software in the public interest group. And suing a software in the public interest group from a PR point of view, is kind of a nightmare. So it is one more reason not to try to mess with these kind of things. EBM, <laughs> on the other hand, it's much more easy to say MPEG LA sued EBM and people are like, okay, I don't care. Like, I don't know, Nokia sued Google, I don't care. But if Google sued Debian software in the public interest, that would be a pure nightmare. So that's one more reason. So. This is really the reasoning. EBM does seem like a much, much fancier target to sue compared to the smaller Ubuntu, which does not seem to be as profitable, or software in the public interest, which is harder to justify from a PR point of view. However, when I talked about these kind of things to the people who took time to explain them to me, 
They also say that usually in these kind of scenarios, you start by seeing the biggest actor in the scene, in this case, EBM. And if you're successful in that, you do have precedent and you start going down to get the most money out of it. So you start with IBM as an example. If you are successful, you switch to Ubuntu and you keep going. So it is rather important for all of the Linux community that this does not happen and that there is no such pre precedence, precedent to be set from IBM. Now, the edited video is probably going to be shorter, but I'm already speaking here for 21 minutes. That's a lot, so let's wrap this up. Remember that I am not a lawyer. Actually, nobody in the Linux world seems to be a lawyer nowadays. Every time I read some source about this, it, all, it always starts with, I'm not a lawyer. Keep in mind this, which, okay, but you know, there are actual lawyers in the Red Hat and EBM legal groups. And when those people were asked about this, the reaction was, do not ship the codex. So we are not lawyers. When actual lawyers got asked, they were like, N no, like, Fedora is right, don't do that. So there's that as well. And all of the, that, all, all of this, all of what I said is kind of the justification on why is that. So it is not, not as simple as Fedora is doing this because they're scared of something that will clearly never happen anyway, because there is an actual chance, there is an actual reason why Fedora, Red Hat are more likely to get sued compared to Ubuntu and that's EBM. And in general, as always, things are much, much more complex that, than they appear. And even if we end up like studying this more in depth and we end up concluding that indeed there's no way that Fedora Red Hat actually gets sued, keep in mind that it's very hard to tell Red Hat, okay, j just wait until we understand, we sort these things up because this just wait means that at any time they could be sued for what they know and that would be will willful and that would be two to three times as expensive. So they, they, it's understandable that they wanted to shut this down as quickly as possible. Now, I will say that the public uh, explanation they gave it was not really good. I think that should have, they should have addressed this kind of things a little better, but keep in mind that Everybody here is slightly scared of speaking <laughs> up because, you know, NDAs like, or they're employed by Red Hat, these kind of things. But yeah, they could have done a better job. Now, I hope this was um, useful. Keep in mind that I'm doing all of this channel, KD development, I do that as well. All can, these kind of things for free. I am too lazy to actually put uh, the links on the screen, but you can find me on Patreon, like patreon.com slash Nicolove, um, LibraPay, if you prefer that, LibraPay.com org slash Nicolove, PayPal, PayPal.me slash Nicolove, that kind of stuff. You can tip me, whatever. I would be happy to receive some $2.3 billion as an example. Intel, if you're watching, you already paid $2 billion to whoever sued you. You can do me as well. No?